Hey everyone, it's Classic DM. We got another episode for first edition AD&D for new players. Today we're going to skip ahead a couple of uh, classes. Previously we talked about the cleric, the fighter. We talked about the druid class, a really powerful area effect class. We talked about the paladin, talked about the ranger. And I want to continue going through that player's handbook and talk about the classes from the first edition because they're the original very first time these classes were truly developed. And uh, I want to skip ahead to the monk. And the reason I want to do that is because there was a posting on one of the Facebook groups where someone was tra talking about the monk and a lot of people were complaining about the monk being weak and pathetic and someone saying he needed to make a terrible frontline fighter and, and I just think there's a lot of things about the monk that people don't realize and I'm thinking too you've played with someone that plays a monk really well and understands their role or you played an MMO where you play a pure DPS or in a raid scenario a lot of players don't really understand um, how to play one properly but you know what we're gonna do like we usually do is we're just gonna go through the player's handbook and uh let's take a look uh, you're gonna start to page 30. now i've got the uh the beautiful reprint here um they did about in 2012 just so it's a little bit cleaner shows up a little bit cleaner and uh, i think that'll work really nice for you to see it on the camera but if you want to get this one open or get your own copy open or your hand copy open just just go ahead and jump over to uh the monk and i think the monk's like page 30 or so all right and I'll zoom in a little bit so we can go over these things. And then we got a battle map set up in the background with characters. And I got a second camera. And we're going to use that second camera for a little bit of a um, close-ups and things like that. So let's just uh, get this back down here. So let's go up to, where were we, page 30. All right. Right, we're talking about right here at the very bottom. There's one thing about formatting I think is crazy. You should always do a start at the top of the page or start on a new page. But in the old days, this stuff was done manually, so it's printed much differently. So, what's the monk all about? What does it say? What, when Gary Gygax and these guys are making this stuff, what, were, what was the idea behind? What was the idea behind the monk? What, what are they trying to say here? So let's just go through it real quick, okay? The monk is the most unusual of all characters, the hardest to qualify for, and perhaps the most deadly. That is absolutely true. The most deadly. Um, if you're stunned, you're dead. And this is the one thing. The monk is like Conor McGregor gone crazy. Meets Floyd Mayweather meets uh who else is a good striker in the ufc if you're you, cowboy Cerrone, i mean this it's, it's just he's just absolutely absolutely deadly um steven wonderboy thompson great kicker not a jiu-jitsu fighter so that's why this class is given out of alphabetical order at the end the section pertaining to character classes so we're going to jump up to the uh the second column here okay and let's just take a look what we got here to be a monk this is the requirements and this is happening all the time in the first edition let me just pop over the battlefield in the background um, so we got the uh, battle map here is from the Ramor House fight in the Greyhawk campaign module G2 Glacial Rift of the Frost Giant Jarl and I got a second little funny little baby camera here which we're going to use for fun for doing uh, little battle camera close ups like this we can talk about some of the combat up close and uh, so before we get too distracted with the battle map let's go back to the uh, let's go back over here to this uh, description of the monk I'm actually going to turn the ambience off because I'm getting a lot of skipping on it tonight. Let's just turn that off in the background just and just mute that. All right, there we go. All right, so where were we? Let's get back over here real quick. So let's pull this over like this so you can see it better because half the column's gone. To be a monk, a character must have the following minimum ability scores. Strength 15, Wisdom 15, Dexterity 15, Constitution 11. Monks never gain any experience point bonuses. If you remember all the other descriptions of classes throughout the player's handbook, they're always talking about how, you know, you if you're playing a druid, if you're playing a druid, you got so much wisdom, or you're playing a fire a, assassin, you're going to get so much bonus to experience if you have a certain number of stats over, or if you're playing a cleric, you're going to get so much bonus for having so many stats over the base numbers and things like that. That's something in first edition that I never use. It's up to you whether you want to use it or not. Um, I don't think that uh, it makes the game better uh, for the character if they happen to have a higher ability score than normal. Remember when the game was first developed, it was coming off kind of a wargaming miniature battle theme. So it wasn't really the... Uh, they weren't really sure. They're still trying to figure that stuff out. The first edition rules are really kind of restrictive. Um, they're not supposed, but it's a game that has a tremendous amount of freedom. So I always encourage people, yes, yeah, try to follow the uh, the restrictions. Don't try to be a monk with 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 stats and 17 strength. Try to do it properly, right? So um, let's just slide this back a little bit so we can uh, take a look at the, at, the, at the player's handbook again while we're talking. I'm just going to slide this over a little bit for you. All right, so... 
um, so the you know the monks never gain experience point bonuses. That's like I said previously, it's referring to the other classes get bonuses if they have certain ability scores that are higher than necessary. All right. So dexterity gives them no armor class adjustment, and that's pretty nasty. And if you go all the way back to the very beginning of the player's handbook, and you read through all the stats and the adjustments for the stats and all that kind of stuff, you'll find that. You know, having high dexterity is highly desirable for almost every single class in the game, even in even in fifth edition. You know, dexterity is really making a big difference. You need that dexterity. It's it's going to give you uh, you know this reduction to your armor class. Um, it's your ability to dodge, move out of the way, have hand-eye coordination. Uh, they call it they have a call it a defensive adjustment in the player's handbook on page 11. You know, when you remember the armor class in first edition goes from negative 10, which is incredibly low, like demigorgon low, all the way to 10, which is just wearing a robe and nothing. Now the armor class numbers are very different in, in three, third edition 3.5, Pathfinder, which is basically 3.5 modified, fourth edition and a fifth edition. And you don't have this base attack bonus that's increasing every single level or proficiency bonuses like it is in fifth edition and first edition. Your dexterity, if you have 17 dexterity, you get a minus three to your armor class. End of story. You're never going to level up to level 20 and have an additional f seven or eight dex dexterity, and that bonus is not going to get bigger. Um, this is probably because the game is you know, coming from a wargaming chain mail and miniature wargaming. You know, human being, you know, Michael Jordan's a really amazing basketball player in his day. He's not the world's greatest golfer, but he's probably better than me. But, you know, his dexterity is just goes, he's a you know, 20 dexterity type guy. Um, but, you know, over his career, he didn't become 29 dexterity. He was still always 20, an amazing human being. Palm the basketball, do all kinds of incredible movement with his body. But this is one thing in the first edition. So the dexterity score is pretty powerful. Um, a minus three to armor class is tremendously powerful that's like gaining that's like going from splint mail and a shield down to zero and so that means a lot because every one of those numbers is almost five percent chance to hit so that's something to take in consideration the numbers get bloated and bigger and spread out more in the other editions. so in first edition you know having 16 dexterity is giving you minus two your armor class that's significant that's a really significant bonus so when you first read that, you know, the first thing you're starting to get a vibe for, you start reading about the monk, is like, oh, wow, they really sound gimpy. And there's reasons why it's this way. And we're going to, as you get more and more into it, you'll see why the reasons are. And once you start playing the class and learn some of the things we're going to talk about today, you'll be like, oh, my God, this class is insane. You've got to play it right. And I think the thing about it, it's like, well, it's the same thing driving a Panzer tank. Uh, you know, you're going to get blown up if you don't play it right. Uh, if you're playing a, sh you know, a DPS shaman in World of Warcraft, you're going to get blown up if you don't play it right. And if you're playing a, a Valkyrie in uh, Black Desert Online in PvP, you're going to get blown up if you don't play it right. This is true of everything. You play Dota, you start running forward like a Diablo character, you're going to get blown up. So the first edition has those type of um, vibes going on where you need to think about how you play the class and... This is really, really important. That's one thing I think that's why they say right off the bat that the monk is probably the most challenging and one of the most rewarding classes. And it's a very great way to say it is the most unusual, hardest to qualify for, and the most deadly. So the qualification it's talking about is really the statistics. Let's get a little further along. Let's keep going. So you don't get the dexterity armor class bonus, right? But you do get a armor class bonus by your level. That's something that no other class in first edition is going to get. So monks are monastic aesthetics. Um who practice rigorous mental and physical training and discipline in order to become superior. So it sounds, you know, almost Asian. It's like you, if you remember old David Carradine in the Kung Fu movie, you know, and uh, or the Karate Kid with Wax On and Wax Off and Mr. Miyagi. <clears throat> you always visualize samurai warriors with the utmost of honor and discipline and, uh, you know, mental control over their emotions and perfection over using their martial weapons or ninjas or whatever. And in classical historical history in the real world, there are a number of societies and cultures that have that kind of stuff going on. So when we say monk, if you go up to some kid in the street and say, hey, man, what's a monk? Well, they think of two things. They can think of a dude with a calligraphy set in the Dark Ages, you know, drawing panels from the 
King James version of the Bible or something, or they think of some kind of, um, you know, Eastern Asian influenced martial artist. Um, and then some people might think of a Buddhist monk, you know, reclusive red robe wearing philosophical worshipers of Buddha. So you're, in the real world, we have, we think of three things when we think of monks, but in D and D it's kind of more of the Eastern influence than it is the traditional Christianity, um, you know, devoid of possessions type, uh, all glory to God type of uh, Christianity perspective. So, you know, the game is pulling a lot from history, but it's putting twists on things as necessary to make things much more interesting. So it's not like playing a cleric. All right, so let's go a little further here. So therefore, they must be lawful in alignment. Although they can be evil, good or neutral with respect to their approaches to lawfulness, a monk who for any reason loses their lawful alignment, loses all monk abilities, must begin as a first-level character. Non-player character monks will be aligned as follows. 50% lawful 25% lawful, neutral, lawful evil. Let's talk about alignment real quick. The alignment is one of those like beat the dead horse, uh, what kind of oil to put in your motorcycle debates. Um, just just use taillight fluid, man. The um, alignment's important in all the campaigns I've ever played. Some people say it doesn't matter. You'll see people in fifth edition forums saying like, well, how come my paladin can't be chaotic evil? I want to be anti-paladin. It's like, that's fine. Then you can do that if you want to. Your DM can do whatever you want to do. The thing about the monk in my opinion, if you're going to play the monk, you need to kind of like, you need to think about what it is to play this. If you're going to drive a 1969 Corvette with a 427 big block and a four speed on it, you're not going to drive that thing around the corners the same way you do a 2017 Corvette with aluminum heads on it. You're not going to drive a cruiser motorcycle the same way you're going to dry, uh, drive a ninja motorcycle. I mean, everything, everything we do, whether we're using golf clubs, rifles, machine guns, cars, everything requires you to think about how to use it perfectly. So it's a tool, even in sports. So playing the monk requires is a tool for you as a player and you're lawful in alignment. Now, what does it mean to be lawful in alignment? Chaotic characters are doing whatever they want, irrespective of repercussions, okay? Lawful characters understand that there is um, a connection between what's right and what's wrong and what's lawful or necessarily moral. Now, you can, so therefore, that doesn't mean lawful good. The paladin has to be lawful good. So that means you have to be good and you have to be lawful. So, you know, murdering someone in cold blood or killing someone who's unarmed and can't defend themselves, those are something a lawful good paladin or lawful good character would object to. It'd be against their moral fiber or character to do that. Now, so if you're playing a lawful good monk, you're going to add that additional restriction of playing a paladin to playing a very hard DPS-oriented class in the monk. I suggest you don't do that. Um, unless you just really, really got this really fantastic, cool idea for this super goody two-shoes Solomon Kane meets save the world Sean Connery type character and you're gonna be lawful good and you're a detective or you know I don't know what your idea is that whatever your character from one of the books you've read you want to play this lawful good monk that's fine do that but the lawful good ad burdens you with a lot of restrictions of what you can and can't do um, you may find yourself since you already are the one of the lowest hit point classes in first edition besides the illusionist and the magician and then the wizard excuse me um, but you're a melee fighter, so you're the lowest hit point melee fighter in first edition. You have the lowest armor class of any melee fighter in first edition. You have the least number of weapons you can use. Your open hand attacks are the most powerful thing in the game. So it's like an exchange. It's like playing a, a rogue in WoW. You can't tank anything, but you can just stun lock someone or zero them. Well, you could in the old days in Wrath of Lich King. I don't know if you can do it anymore. So lawful alignment's kind of a big deal when playing a monk. So you don't have to play lawful good. Um, you know, you could be evil. You could be lawful evil. So that's kind of interesting. It's the only class of the game that says, hey, man, you want to be a, a lawful evil monk? You, you're you like a Sith Lord or something and from Star Wars. You could run around being evil and with a chaotic evil party and raiding villages and killing people and do whatever you wanted to do, but you don't want to do it with a chaotic slant. You do it lawfully. So lawful evil characters are going to have like a sect and an order imagine like the knight templars from the crusades so a big scar on humanity's history all um because they're them lawful evil in the, in some perspectives you know they're what they're doing is for their cause they believe what they're doing is good but what they're really doing is murdering people for their religion so that's just another debate about that but if you play lawful neutral which is I always find to be really compelling when you pair yourself up with a druid, like this is Felcherna, this is Elephantisi from our campaign. Um, pure neutral druid and lawful neutral monk make a fantastic duo. 
absolutely incredible duo. Even though they're not frontline fighters, between the the Druid's healing and the Druid's air effect crowd control spells and the Monk's ability to stun and destroy things with melee attacks, very, 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 very powerful. That is until, you know, someone that's 15 feet tall with a two-handed sword comes on screen and starts wailing on the Monk because the Monk has really, 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 really bad low armor class. So the moment you have... You know, Mr. Ready to Crush Someone's Face and appear on the screen, uh, your little monk's going to have serious trouble. So, in those situations, like I said before, it's like playing a bard in EverQuest 1. You're going to be a kiting bard, a swarm bard. You're not going to play a melee, a frontline fighter bard, okay? So, you have to think about how to use the class appropriately. So, lawful is a decision I recommend for new players. Play lawful neutral and adopt a st uh, stoic uh, attitude with your character's decision making. Um, so let's go take a look here at the next part. A brief study of the character classes, Table 1 and 2 will reveal the monk appears to be quite weak, even considering that the topmost level a monk can have is 18, albeit four-sided hit dice, an average of 45 hit points without constitution score modifiers. So it's like, you like, do what? What are you talking about? Let's just take a look at our kids from our campaign here. This is Mercedes, okay? And in our first edition campaign, we do max hit points. So level 1 fighter is D10 health. That means you get 10 hit points. You get a constitution bonus. In this case, her constitution bonus is what? Um, plus one. She gets 11 hit points per level. So um, she's level 12, so she has 120 plus the plus additional 12. So it gives her 132. So that's max hit points. That's how I run the campaigns. That's because I have frost giants in my world running around with 80 health. They're not running around with 42 health. So max hit points for the monsters, um, max hit points for the bad guys. That sounds really nice, doesn't it? Now I'll go ahead and just take a look and see what the monk's max hit points are. Oof, 40. So there's some really, na you know, you're going to go up against something that's got an 80 hit point frost giant in my campaign or, you know, a 64 hit point, you know, winter wolf or something like that. And suddenly you only have 40 hit points and you have one of the worst armor classes in the game. Well, it's called challenge. So it's really, really interesting thing to think about. So a lot of people don't like that. Um, you're giving yourself a lot of, uh, you're making it very difficult for you to be successful mathematically. But that's not what the class is about. The class is not about stepping, taking a step forward like Mercedes and landing a two-handed sword hit on something and destroying something, um, or certainly not like the power of, uh, let's see, let's take a look at Varenjar, right? Where is he at? Look at Varenjar. He's probably the nastiest, most brutal character in the game in our campaign, especially ever since he got this uh, girdle of uh, uh, fire giant strength. I mean, his bonus to damage is just absolutely nasty. So he's playing, in a, he's an assassin. So an assassin's going to get, you know, let's take a look at the hit tables real quick, right? Um, the assassin's going to roll on the, um, this is the fighter, paladin, ranger, bard uh, hit table. This is the thieves assassin's table. So to hit AC zero for a level 10 or 12 assassin, it's going to be around, you know, a base to hit AC zero, like 12 or 14. For um, him, you know, it's 12, right? So a monk, it's a 14. So you see this Thacko number here, which is kind of a second edition thing. I like using it, though. So for the monk, let's take a look at every character in our game, okay, in our campaign. Level 12 fighter only needs a 6 to hit AC zero. Level 12 fighter needs a 6. Monk, a 14. That's 40% less chance to hit something, Okay. That's each one of those one each digit on a D20. On a D20, it's going to be 5%. Okay, that's a, you know, that's a 35% roll right there. So that's a disadvantage for you. Your roll to hit table as a monk is um, it's going to be the same thing as a cleric druid's monk table, which is usually pretty decent, except you're not getting any bonuses to hit from your strength. So there's lots of things that start off, like if you put um, Antola, and Elephanisi side by side fighting two winter wolves or something. Let's just turn these guys this way real quick, right? So here's Antola and here's Elephanisi, and they're fighting these two winter wolves. And uh, so who's gonna? What's it gonna take for everyone to hit anything, right? Let's say that Antola take, say Antola pairs off against this one here, and Elephanisi attacks the one to the side. Okay, and we'll get her off the screen, I'm trying to steal the limelight. Um, What's it going to take to hit things? Well, let's take a look at the character sheets real quick. So if she needs to hit, say those things are AC4, or AC4, okay? So that means she only needs a 10 to hit the Winter Wolf that's directly in front of her. Now, what does it take for Antola to hit it, right? Now, it's on the same table as her, 
right? But he's using a weapon. He only needs a 10. So his, and if this thing is AC4, it means he only needs a 6. That's because he's using a plus 4 flail. Well, she's not using something like that. So if she needed to really get land a good hit, that's why you'd have a magical weapon. But when you, the weapons you have at your disposal for Monk are punk weapons. They're like staves. And I think they even get like little crossbows or something. So the open hand attacks are great utility. Or if you're a really, really great Monk player, you know when to rotate out to the magical melee weapon you've hopefully collected and then using open hand attacks. So you really need to land a hit but you know it's not going to do a lot of damage, like you want to help finish something off, um, then you can use the melee weapon, but your damage output is going to be as low as an illusionist or a magic user because you're not going to get any bonus damage from your strength or anything like that. And this is going to become more apparent as we get further in here. Um, so let's go down here. So we talked about the hit points being really low. They have no spell abilities, cannot wear armor or use a shield, and not even flaming oil is usable by them. The flaming oil thing is something I haven't talked about yet. I'll go. I'll make it real short. One sentence, right? The first edition D&D puts a huge emphasis upon Molotov cocktails. <laughs> it's not some kind of troubles from Ireland or anything. Uh, flaming oil was a way to, in the Middle Ages, and then if you play Hail Caesar or any of the war games, you understand what that stuff's like. I mean, this is a warfare tactic used in, in history to defend castles and keeps and destroy infantry. So um, it's used and it's, you know, it's carried over in D&D as a viable way for players to you know, burn things to death in passageways with this petroleum jelly type flaming oil thing. So, excuse me. So the, there's a lot of rules in the first edition player's handbook that talk about flaming oil. And after you read it like 10 times, it's like reading a Stephen King novel. You're like, oh my God, he said the sentence 16 times in this one book. He really wants the point driven home to tie into the character. Well, first edition puts a lot of emphasis on this flaming oil thing. Okay. So now they realize you when they're writing this, um, this seems to make a weak character class indeed, most definitely. So not only when you're reading this, if you read a Pathfinder book by Jason Bullman or you're reading one of the new 5th edition books, you're like, everything's all upbeat, everything's exciting. You're talking about, it has a great picture of this barbarian character or the monk is wearing this amazing gear. And you're like, wow, what a really neat character. And they talk about the powerful things the character can do and what their innate skills are and what they're going to do to be amazing. And you think, wow, what a hero a character from a film, right? When you're reading the player's handbook in the first edition, it keeps telling you, you're just going to be hard as the devil to get the stats to roll the monk. You're going to have the lowest hit points in a game. You can't wear any armor. You can't use a shield. Um, they're definitely going to be hard to play. So it's very, it seems like one of the last characters described in the player's handbook. But it's also one of the most powerful. So when you get to the powerful part, you'll be like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. Because this impression is false. The monks have their own special attack and defense capabilities. Certain other powers and most abilities in the thief class has some clerical type capabilities as well. So while the class has drawbacks, it is very strong. So for me personally, if you ever played any MMOs, I'm a big MMO player. You always have this, uh, you have your favorite classes, right? So at Black Desert Online, um, I love the Tamer. Tamer is one of my favorite classes. In Neverwinter, which is 4th edition, I love the Guardian Fighter and I love the, uh, the Cleric. In Never One Nights uh, 1 and 2, I enjoy playing the Druid. I also enjoy the Assassin uh, and the Thief. Um, you know, sneak attack is just nasty. Um, also enjoy playing, a, 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 I think it was a fighter or duelist that used rapiers because the threat range of rapiers was like 15 to 20 some overpowered garbage that they fixed in 5th edition. You know, if you're playing a World of Warcraft and it just goes, Mortal Strike Warrior, just so much fun. Just love it. Absolutely a riot. Love playing an elemental shaman. Love playing an enhancement shaman. So anyway, um, this kind of class is a class that has that kind of vibe to it. You have to love it you have to love the challenge because you have to be creative with how you play it so if you're the kind of person that wants a challenge where you can be very creative and you can do the right thing at the right time and <clears throat> destroy uh, an enemy really really quickly or change the tide of a losing battle in one to hit roll um, this is a class for you so they're not like the monk in EverQuest 1 they're not just a pulling machine that feigns death all the time um, some of the stuff in EverQuest 1, of course, is influenced by 1st edition D&D, and some of it almost blatantly lifted. But hey, you know, all these games, they pay homage to each other anyway. So, the respect to combat monks attack at the same table as thieves, however, they have one half their hit point per level experience the amount of damage they score on a successful attack with a weapon. So, um, this is kind of interesting. You have to read this very carefully. So, they attack on the same table as thieves, and we showed you that earlier on the DM screen, right? 
So you can see that the monk's going to do on the same ta table for thieves and assassins. But if you look up here, it says attack matrix for clerics, druids, and monks. So the numbers are actually technically different. So it's kind of a confusing sentence. But they add one half of their hit point per level of experience to the amount of damage they score when they successfully attack an opponent with a weapon. Okay? So let's just take let's just pull the board out here with a marker, right? So what was it was it going to what is it going to take here? I just scrolled down a page, sorry about that. Here we go. So you need let's say you're a level 10 monk, okay? And one half of a hit point per level experience. So that would be 5. So you'd add plus 5 to all your damage when you use a staff. So it's like having a plus five enhancement bonus if you're a third edition player. So it's kind of like the Ranger. Do you remember how the Ranger had like a damage bonus, but only against giants? This is against everyone. So if you're playing the monk, that's one thing you'll notice about Elfanisi. You've been following the show closely. She always, always open hand because she's the stun roll. But if she, her damage to bonus here, she has this plus four Bastion of Light Staff. It does one to six damage, plus four for the enhancement, kind of a bonus. But her half her level of ten would be additional five. It's never added in because we never use the staff. If we were to use the staff, we would add that da additional damage number in. So that's something to think about. Because if you get a great weapon with a monk, that's something that's going to be almost like having a free magic item. If you're a level 20 monk, you're getting a plus ten enhancement bonus. And if you have, because <laughs> I mean, you're not going to get the strength bonus. So you and so it's a really interesting way to think about how am I going to do good consistent damage and will my spiky damage be better than someone else's? So you hear a lot of people saying like my monk's level five and I get destroyed in Village of Hamlet or or I'm playing the Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh or I'm playing the Hidden Shrine of Tomoshan or Tumahar is like you're playing the class wrong if you're, that's happening to you. So um, as we go through this, you'll see some of the ideas on how to play the class. Have a lot of fun. So that's an interesting point. Be sure to. Remember that the key factor is, is this one word with this phrase with a weapon. Okay, so if you're using your open hands, which are not weapons, they're part of your body, that bonus doesn't apply. Okay, because other things apply to that type of situation. This simulates their study and knowledge of weapons and anatomy. A first level monk scores X plus one half hit point of damage. We just did that math for you, so we won't roll into this. It's just giving an example, right? Um, Monks of medium level and above actually fight better without weapons using their open hands despite the weapon damage bonus they receive. That really depends what you picked up, what you've picked up in your campaign. So when you've been playing with your, uh, um, playing with your friends and playing in your um, campaign and you realize that uh, um, um, you've suddenly got yourself, you found yourself with some fantastic bonus you know, weapon that's an artifact or something, you may want to use the weapon and then you may want to switch out and not use the weapon. So, um, something to think about, but the open hand stuff is nasty and we're going to get to that and you'll be laughing at hell. So the open hand combat damage is shown amongst table two below. Let's just go ahead and jump down to that real quick. Let's just zoom this back out. Okay. Where we got that at? Where's our damage table they're talking about? Here we go. So it's this column you're seeing right here, okay? And when you highlight in the PDF, it does funny things here. Let's zoom in a little bit closer here. So this is based on what level you are. So it's novice, initiate, um, et cetera, et cetera. All these funky names. Let's just zoom in a little closer here. So this is column here. As you get higher and higher level, master of spring, summer, autumn, wind, east wind, et cetera, what, you know, what happens is your base armor class goes up. So if you're like a level 17 monk, you have negative three armor class wearing nothing. So if you're wearing rings of protection or cloaks and things like that, it can get even lower. Low levels, though, I mean, you're level 7 monk and you have an AC of 5. So you're kind of like someone in scale mail with a shield. Your movement speed is insane, which is going to be better than anyone's movement speed in the entire game the moment you roll the monk. Everyone's movement rate is going to be 15, I mean 12. Human movement rates can be 12. You're going to be able to outrun a frost giant at level 1 monk. So you'll be able to outrun a dire wolf at a level 2 monk. So that's something that people don't think about. So in combat, especially using miniatures, when you're one inch equals five foot grid, remember the monk can outrun things. So the monk can kite things. The monk can chase something down. The monk can evade. Since they don't really have an attack of opportunity rule in the first edition, but I use it anyway, um, the monk's movement is a powerful tool that they can use at their disposal to change the tide of the battle. 
So this is what it's talking about here, the open hand attacks per melee round. So you get one attack, one attack, one attack, five, four. We talked about that in the last episode. Five, four means that over the course of four rounds, you can have a total of five attacks. Um, you'll need to decide, like, I'm going to go, uh, you know, a left, a left hook and a right cross, or I'm going to do all three attacks in the first, and then I'm just going to do one, two, and three, the next three subsequent rounds. You can divide that up however you want. That's the way I like to let players decide how to do it. Maybe need, sometimes I say you need to land an initial hit, and then you can choose to do a follow-up. If you miss the initial hit, you can't do a follow-up. You can do those kind of rules if you want to. But if you're a level 17 monk, you're going to get four attacks per round. That's a lot. No one gets that many attacks per round. So your DPS is going to get... You just It's almost like the monk was in uh, Mist of Pandaren or whatever in World of Warcraft, that punching, stunning Windwalker thing. So that was pretty crazy. Now, this is what happens. If the open hand damage is terrible at first, second, third, fourth... And only when you get to fourth level, you're starting to do like scimitar damage or rapier damage. When you get to level five, you're doing um, <clears throat> footman's flail kind of damage. Then suddenly you get to around level 10, and now you're doing three of 13, which is 2d6 plus one, right? We used to do that as uh, 3d4, but 3d4. But so that's, you know, that's like bastard sword damage. So once you hit level 10, things start getting uh, much nicer for you. Um, the spell, special abilities start coming to play around the third level. So you get abilities really early on. So when they're referencing that table, it's on the subsequent page on page 31. Let's go back to uh, let's go back to this real quick and cover and cover this some more. All right. Monk saving th make saving throws on the same table as Thieve, where they gain certain advantages. This is very interesting rule too here. Non magical missiles, which means arrows, crossbow bolts, bullets, thrown daggers, thrown boulders. Okay, from giants. So if you've got a, a giant on screen, he's throwing a boulder at you, you you have a good chance of evading it and having it not hit you. So this guy's on screen, he's going to throw this boulder at you, and you're over here, and a big boulder comes flying through the air like this, you get a chance to evade it. Let's just do that real quick. Let's say this giant has a boulder, and he's going to we'll put this big fool on the screen, right? Let's put this big dude here. He's a huge, so this huge giant here, and uh, he's going to throw a boulder at you. He's going to throw a boulder at Elephanisi. She's over here, and she sees him, and he sees her. He's going to wing this boulder at her. So she has a chance to actually evade being hit by it. So she makes her saving throw against petrification. So let's just take a look at that. So, so her saving throw versus petrification is uh, right here, number, is a 10. So say he rolls a hit, and he rolls a natural 20, right? So the guy rolls a natural 20, and it's going to hit no matter what. So there's your natural 20. She still gets a saving throw. So if she rolls a uh, you know, roll of 17, that means she completely misses, if I'm not mistaken. Let's double check that real quick, okay? Um, which would normally hit, can be dodged or knocked aside. So she's certainly not going to reach out with her open hand fist and crush a 120-pound you know, frozen boulder with her open hand and crush and break her hand and break her arm. But if that was just an arrow or a crossbow bolt, she can deflect it aside like Wonder Woman or something. So dodging it's always a better move because, in my opinion, if someone's throwing something at you, you can dodge. That means the player now has the option of either like ducking down as it goes past like this and then maintaining position or sidestepping to the side and gaining a position attack. So you can actually use this dodge move from normal missiles to advance yourself forward or take a step without having incurring a movement count. So that's something that's really interesting to think about. Um, so... In other respects, if a monk makes his or her saving throw against an attack form, the monk will sustain no damage from the attack, even if the attack form was a fireball. This is very interesting. In the game, someone casts a fireball. These are like area effect burning spells, right? So say, let's get this guy out of the way. Let's say you had some evil um, wizard. You know, this is obscure and she's not evil. And she's going to cast some kind of a... She's going to cast lightning bolt or fireball in those nasty third level spells. Those spells all have saving throws. And those spells have what you call a saving throw for half damage. So we'll put Elephant Easy here, right? And say she casts a fireball and it's centered at this point right here. And so it's got this, you know, 30 foot radius or something. It's going to boom and it's going to blow up this whole area. And she would normally have to, and so she's, you know, within, this is the area that's going to get burned, right? So she's within the... The, effect, the field of effect, this fireball comes zipping out of her hand, and go bam, right? So you normally get a saving throw against fireball, and so she had to roll her saving throw. For her, she would roll against um, against spells, I think it is, if I'm not mistaken. So 
So say she made a roll or saving throw, she rolled a four, say she failed, because she needed to roll higher than the number on, on a saving throw. So in that situation, she would take full damage, which I think is 66 damage or something like that. Um, if she had made the saving throw, she takes half damage. So no matter what, those spells from the magic user um, are very, very powerful. They allow you to do damage no matter what. The worst case scenario is you're doing half damage, okay? Um, it's not like saving throws in EverQuest 1 or something where you do like no damage at all and things are resisted. I don't know if you remember that or not. Some games uh, change those rules later on. But read this about the monk, right? So, here we go. Here we go. <clears throat> In other respects, meaning what we're just talking about, if the monk makes her saving throw against the attack form, the monk will sustain no damage from the attack, even if the attack was a fireball. So if you save um, her petrification roll, despite the spell resist roll, she'll take no damage at all. Whereas anyone else who would save takes half damage. So that's something about the monk that's much, uh, much more powerful than you realize. So they're basically trying to say that like you can like dodge and flip out of the way if you want to really make the gameplay situations interesting what you can say is like the monk tries to you know jump in the air and roll sideways and lands on her back or whatever and lands on her feet like a cat and when the fireball explodes she's in midair and is able to move around in a way where it doesn't actually ignite and burn her so she gets you the whole fireball goes off you know everything in the area gets singed and you have a uh, you know, cleric that took 12 damage, and you have the druid that took 15 damage, and there's the monk right in the front that took no damage, and the monk has a fire movement rate, and she can collapse to close the gap and get in this girl's face pretty fast while everyone else is recovering. Um, so this is a really interesting rule. Uh, so, that, so that is a fireball would do 50% total damage, but the gaze of basilisk would still petrify the monk. This is They're talking about um, spells that have instantaneous effects. So if you had some kind of monster that uh, did a petrification gaze, that's not something you dodge. So it makes sense. So things like lightning bolts or um, ice storm or fireball, there's not all the spells and a lot of spells in the first edition that are like that, that give you a chance to do a saving throw. And if you save, you take half damage. Some of them are save and take nothing. Um, some of them are, when they're a projectile, kind of like there's a burning field. Um, sometimes this that it gives you a chance to take half damage. So the monk actually saves, she takes no damage whatsoever. Um, this is interesting. Remember we talking about the ranger? This is another surprise rule. At first level experience, a monk is as likely to be surprised as any other character. So one third, it goes down by 2% at second level, goes down there of 2% per, per level beyond that. So this is kind of weird. So it's not as incredible as the ranger's uh, defenses against surprise. So if you're level 10, um, you're going to gain this uh, uh, three, uh, go get, it's like a, was it 2% per level thereafter? Yeah. So just to make it a round number, 20% less chance to be surpri surprised if you're level 10. And it's just going to get better and better and better. So what they're trying to do here is to say there's a 1 in 3 chance. So if you roll a D6 and you roll 1 to 3, you could be surprised. So in that situation, we, re we just rolled a 3 here and you would be surprised. But with the monk... If she's like level, let's say, like she's level like eight or something, that'd be enough. She might have to roll a two. So it becomes harder and harder to surprise the monk. Not that like as powerful as the ranger who has this like never surprised type rule. So this is trying to play into the fact of her being a fantastic mind, body, physicality, control of herself, as opposed to being the ranger who has senses, who has an instinct. Um, the monks have the following thief abilities. They can form identical to experience that of a thief. So if you're playing a monk, you get some thief abilities, but not all of them. So you get open locks, which is really useful. Okay. Uh, what you're not getting is pickpockets. You get find and remove traps, move silently, hide in shadows, hear noise, and of course, climb walls. So let's just move this back over here so you can see it a little bit better. So you can see, let's take a look at Elephant EC again. Okay. So we've got her thief abilities right down here. Okay. Right here on here on her character sheet. Um, so she has an open locks at 77%, find and remove trap 65, move silently 83, hear noise 68, um, excuse, hear, excuse me, hear noise is 30%, climb walls is 99%. So this is one thing that people tend to forget, the climb walls ability is one of the most powerful abilities for the thief in a game, and with the high movement rate that she's going to have as a monk, hers is 24 at this level. That's incredible, that's twice as fast, that's faster than any football player can run the 40 yard dash. So that's something about this class you really need to take into consideration. All right. This is the last thing about, uh, not the last thing, but the last few things about the monk that are pretty straightforward. Um, 
all of the chance of falling while climbing walls is the same as a thief, which is like almost nothing at higher levels. Um, you don't t you can take certain you can fall certain distances and be within a distance of a wall and take no damage. That means like if you were to fall into a pit and say it's a twenty foot deep pit and you take one d six damage for every ten feet. So he says it's a forty foot deep pit. So the DM says you you know trap door opens you fall you take there's forty six of damage that's rolled out for you. He's like oh my goodness I'm gonna take what is that eight and and six is uh, fourteen and five is fifteen points of damage I'd be taking from falling down this pit. Say there's a trap door pit right here and you fell down it. The thing is with a monk that's not gonna happen to you because you can almost bounce off the walls on the way down. So in this situation if you're a level uh, six level monk you could fall up to thirty feet. As if you're, as long as you're within four feet of a wall. So in midair, like in a matrix or some kind of Cirque Soleil character, you can kind of move your body while falling and touch the walls, embrace and slow down your fall. You don't grab the walls and hang on like Spider-Man, but you've got this like innate acrobatic ability to prevent yourself from taking damage. So you can basically break your fall by being near objects. So at 13th, you can fall any distance if you're within eight feet of a wall. Okay, that's so that means you can run down the side of a mountain. <laughs> as ridiculous as that sounds, it sounds like something out of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, or the Hero movie. So as long as you're within eight feet, okay? So in your battle grid that you're playing with your friends, each one of these five, uh, one, each one of these one inch squares equals five feet. So if you're at first edition, a monk, this is going to be probably to about here. So this distance here, this is the first five feet. Here's an extra three feet. So this is about eight feet right here. So as long as she is within that distance, and that goes both directions, okay? It goes eight feet the other way, too. It's, it's almost like a radius. So this radius, as long as you're within a wall, any distance, if you're at level 13, that is, um, that's extremely powerful. I've only ever had one other player take advantage of that once to run down the side of a cliff and have monsters chase them, and the monsters fell down the cliff, almost like something you see in The Lion King. So... Um, Here's another thing. The, the monk must have an opportunity to periodically make contact with the wall during the descent. So you're not just running in midair and you know running down this with the racer here. You're not just running down the side of the mountain in the air and just free falling 300 feet and boom, I take no damage, I'm a cat. You have to like flip over and touch the wall. So you can like brace your fall as your, uh, um, let's put that side of the side scraper eraser here, right? So as long as you can touch the wall, you'll be able to do it. So, and then on page, uh, this is 31 still. Let's just bring this down to 75% or so. <clears throat> of course, you have the experience table, which you always have for any character class in the game, right? That's pretty straightforward. The next thing to think about is these ones here. And then you get these special abilities. And this goes with A through G, H, I, J, K. And then there's an, um, and there's some other abilities at the end. These are the ones that are really, really nasty. We need to go through these in detail. This class is extremely detailed. And it's going to take a while to get it all wrapped up. But let's even get this done in the next 20 minutes. So we're going to zoom in this a little bit to, to go through these individually. So these happen to you at different levels. It's almost like gaining skills in third edition. So at level three, you get A, B, C. So every level thereafter, you're going to get A through K. Okay? So let's see what they are. The ability to speak with animals as druids do begins at third level. So this is something that is really, 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 really powerful. So if you have a situation where um, there's two um, winter wolves and you can speak to them without pissing them off and making them mad, you might be able to convince them to help you. Now, the thing about the druid doing that, she did that in this adventure, actually in this very area, because she shape-shifted into the shape of winter wolf and then spoke winter wolf to the winter wolves. It's almost like a scene from the Jungle Book, right? So that's something very interesting. The monk, if you, you would know the winter wolves would see a monk and come attack it immediately because they think you're a human being. And even if you did speak wolf, they would probably hard-pressed to believe you. But if you were to be concealed behind a rock and hiding in shadows, and there was a winter wolf here and a winter wolf here, and you wanted to make a noise to... to Tell the other Winter Wolves, like, hey, help, help, I'm in trouble. And they would hear this voice. They might come running and investigate to see what's going on with this sound. It might surprise it, and your party might be sitting behind a corner here waiting with a kill zone to destroy everything. So that's something to think about as well that's uh, an interesting opportunity. Use this speak with animals to, that means any animal, um, to deceive and trick other animals. Do the audio aspect of it, not just speak with them and ask them questions like, what time of day is it, and do you have a watch on? So that's something else to think about with uh, with the monk that other characters don't really get a chance to do. Um, 
The second one here is the ability to mask the mind. So ESP has only a 30% chance of success. ESP means someone's reading your mind. Okay, whether it's a mind flayer or, or another character using psionics, which is pretty rare. Um, no one can tell whether you're think what you're thinking or if you're lying or anything like that. So this gets better and better and better. Um, so you basically just mask your mind so no one can do anything like that to you. Okay. At uh, fifth level, you're not subject to disease of any sort. Or you're also never nor ever affected by haste or slow spell. So this is interesting because you're gaining a lot of a uh, uh, number of attacks per round as you get higher and higher level. So you kind of get nerfed because you don't get the chance to um, gain haste effects. So there's no benefit for you to be hasted in any way. Um, because you'll never be able to be affected by it. But if you're level four, then yeah, you can be hasted. But also at the same time, you can't be slowed. Now, this is tricky because you need to read the slow spell to know what they're talking about. Are they talking about snares? Or are they just talking about slowing your movements and attacks? I always play it as talking about the movement slow spell, like you move slowly, not um, snared and you're held in ground by roots, like grasping roots might do to you or something like that. So um, let's go over here to the next one. This is interesting. D, the ability to use self-induced catalepsy to appear dead. This can be done perfectly at six level higher. The monk is able to lower his or her body temperature. Okay, let's just go over here and scroll over so you can see this. There we go. Um, to maintain this state for twice the number of turns, 10 appears equal to their level. So if you're level 10 monk like Elephanisi, uh, that means for 20 10-minute turns, which is what, 200 minutes? It's like two hours, three hours or so like that. Um, you could just lay on the ground as if you're dead, lower your heart rate, and anything would come by and would think you're dead. So imagine you were a monk and you made this noise to from behind a rock here. Let's just move the camera over here a little bit for fun. That uh, light's kind of bright. Okay, let's say that you were... Um, Say these two guys are, say you're over here, okay? You're behind this Remor has rock, and this is Winter Wolf facing in this direction over here. So Winter Wolf number one, Winter two, they're like trippy trotting back and forth and zipping back over here to these pile of bones. They happen to be turned away. You could say something in Winter Wolf that they could hear, yell at something like, help, help, help. And you could lay on the ground and pretend to play dead, and then Winter Wolves will come explore, come check out the area, and they see you laying on the ground dead, and for, and for all intents and purposes, they would not be fooled they would be fooled they would never know that you're not really dead now they may be hungry they may try to bite you and take a bite of you but you can pull and control and distract them that could be used as a distraction method to uh, distract someone you could have a situation where um, you're in a nasty battle and uh, you've been hit really really hard so you want to pretend like you've been nailed so something will stop attacking you and won't try to kill you so that's really tricky. It's going to require a smart DM to be able to, con to control that in a battle situation. But if you need to play dead, you know, you could be in the prison cell or trap somewhere and you can lay on the ground and pretend like you're dead and the jailer and the guard might come in and the other people might come in and might pick your body and start dragging you out. And as soon as they get you out of the jail cell, you can like pop up a line and start stunning people. So there's all kinds of interesting ways you can use that to uh, change the tide of your battle. At seventh level, the monk gains the ability to heal damage on his or her body. The amount of damage can be healed is two to five hit points. And this is kind of weird. If you're going to play max hit points and max health, you should play max heals as well. It just stands to sense. Um, you don't want to have, it shouldn't be two to four. It should just be, you know, it should just be the max number possible. Let's pull this in like this a little bit. There you go. So um, you gain one hit point with each experience level. So this heal, it can only be done once a day. It's certainly nothing. It doesn't even compare to lay a hand from EverQuest 1 or anything like that. It's just a little baby heal. But remember, the monk doesn't have a lot of health. So from the perspective of it's something. So you can do this once per day. You can almost like you know heal yourself um, once per day. And ability F, um, the ability to speak with plants as druids do. This power is attained at eighth level. Speaking with plants is something a lot of players don't do. You know, you hear about people that talk to their plants and they water them. Um, why would you want to talk to a plant? Well, say you were investigating an area and you wanted to find out you could actually just talk to weeds on the ground in a dungeon and find out is, and it seems like there's a secret passage room. You can't find it. You could actually talk to the plants and say, or do any of the, has anyone come in the room and who's been in the room and what walls did they move and how they open the wall and what were they talking about in this room? And if you're very creative, 
Um, that kind of spell could be used to, to help you recreate what happened on the crime scene or, or recreate what the room is used for. If you go into a guard room and it's completely empty and there's any plants there, you can actually speak to the plants and find out who's normally in here, how many are here, how often they come. But people don't usually do that. They just think of speaking with plants. Why would I want to do that? So think of it as a free informant. Plants are a neutral entity. They don't, they're not going to lie to you. You know, they're just going to tell you the truth. So number G is interesting, interesting because, uh, beguiling charms hypnosis to just only have a 50 percent chance to affect the monk that life level experience this is brilliant because whole person is one of the nastiest spells in the game so if anyone has ever played Baldur's gate you've probably had to load a save game because you got popped with whole person and then you just got destroyed after like four or five melee rounds of not having control of your character um so when you're a monk you're going to be immune to that so that's pretty nasty let's go over here to h we'll just drag this back over here um, this is going to be useful in uh, the Vault of the Drow. <laughs> Telepathic and Mind Blast attacks. See this, Mind Flayers upon a monk at level 10 are made as if the character had 18 intelligence due to the monk's mental discipline. So let's just take a look at Elephantese real quick. She doesn't have 18 intelligence. She has tw uh, 12 intelligence. So you make saving throws against those type of mental attacks against a Mind Flayer. I haven't made anybody's not painted. Um, you're going to get to make that saving throw as if you had 18 intelligence. It's going to help you. Um, that's not going to happen a lot. Excuse me. It's not going to happen a lot in your campaign. You're not going to have tons and tons of situations where you're going to make these saving throws like that. So it's just another way to save it. Like, well, is there other scenarios where that might benefit me? Um, maybe there is. Maybe there isn't. Okay, what else we got here? At level 11 or higher, the experience of monks are not affected by poison of any type. So now, no more diseases, no more poisons. That's really fantastic, especially if you are fighting a bunch of drow, which I don't have any drow here. Um... Say you're fighting some drow male cleric and he's using a poisoned weapon, and, you know, or you're, they're shooting you with these little javelin throwers, these poisoned uh, hand crossbows. You know, poison's nasty in the game, and if you don't have to make a saving throw to it, you're immune to it. So that's really helpful. It's those are little baby bonuses that help in certain situations. They don't help everywhere all the time, um, but it's better than that. This gaze and quest spells have no effect upon monks level 12 and higher. This is something that I've only ever seen done once in the entire my D and D years of playing D and D. Now I took plenty of years off of it for sure, but I think there was a situation where Ed Stark was running a campaign. He's a former creative director of the second edition, and we were all working together at Warhammer 40k MMO in Austin. We played D and D at his house for a couple weekends. He was running a third edition campaign of 3.5, and he had a um, a, he a Babylonian king headed kind of lion creature. I can't remember what the animal was. And it gave us a quest and it like forced us to answer these riddles and things like that. So that Gias quest, how you pronounce it, G E A S, look that up, read that spell, learn, and then realize that the uh, monk's not going to be affected by those. The last ability gain and perhaps the most terrible power is that fable attack which enables a monk to set up vibrations in the body of the victim and a monk can then control such vibrations as to cause death to occur when the monk stops them known as the quivering palm the monk merely touches the victim to set the deadly vibrations the victim can be virtually any creature this power is limited as follows so it's almost like a death touch right so what are the rules on that it can be attempted but once per week it's like oof when would you ever use it then? Monk must touch the intended victim for within three melee rounds. The power is drained for one week. It has no effect on undead creatures. The victim cannot have more hit dice than the monk. So you don't go to the sleeping dragon and do it. Excuse me. Uh, long day. He cannot exceed the hit points of the monk by another 200%. So, you know, you're not going to go up to Lulth and put Quivering Palm on her and kill her in one hit, right? Um, so, you know, you could do it to you could do it to a Frost Giant, right? You could have two frost giants that were sleeping in beds. I don't have a bed map up here. And you could go up to one of them and set up a quivering palm, hiding shadows, and do it from surprise of the guy sleeping, and you can kill him. Um, there's no saving throw related to this, if, I don't, if I'm not mistaken. The command to die, the control of vibration, is supposed to be given by the monk with a set time limit. So you have to do something. You have to do this ability, call it out. It's like a called shot and pull. Activate it. Let it go off. Turn it off. And then the character will just die. So it's a good way to assassinate something. Um... There's other restrictions the monk has to abide by, like their armor and weapons, treasure, magic items used by them. So this is when I said earlier they don't get to wear any armor at all. Um, and I have limited by the weapons the weapon table, which are all kind of uh, clicky little clubs and things like that. I'm not going to scroll back to the table, but I'll leave it like it is. Um, they have some limitations of what they can use. They're not supposed to have more than two magic weapons. They don't have a lot of magic items. 
Um, they don't gain any bonuses with respect to increasing to hit probability due to the strength ability. This is one that's kind of buried away. So look at Elephantisi's character sheet here, right? Even though she has 16 strength, it says none monk, none monk. So she doesn't get a bonus to hit because she's a monk. So she was a f she was a fighter. Um, take a look at uh, take a look at Varenjar. Well, he's got high strength because he got that belt on. Okay, here's 16 strength, same strength as uh, her, right? Notice he doesn't have a bonus to hit, but he has a bonus to damage. The monk doesn't get that at all, no matter what. So you would not want to give a girdle a fire giant strength to monk because it can't benefit from it. So they don't gain benefit because it increases their strength, okay? Um, until attaining the rank of master, monks may not have any hirelings. I'm not going to go off on a tangent about the hireling thing. I've talked about it in every single one of these episodes so far. It's just kind of a personal preference. But as you know, in first edition, there's tons and tons of rules about henchmen and hirelings and things like that. So there are some rules about the monk and how many followers they can have. Um, this, there can only be a limited number of monks above seventh level. If there are three, eight level, this is kind of another strange thing, trying to make the monk feel extra special. Um, I personally don't think that that's a, a great rule, but it might be something interesting to have in your campaign uh, where there's only an X number of monks of a fabled level. Uh, level 7 and 8 is kind of low, to tell you the truth, but it's really up to you how you want to run it. Um, this is about followers, this section here. This is about gaining followers, another rule that you probably don't need to worry about too much. Um, this is all followers. This is the monastery headquarters thing. Every single character entry in the first edition talks about this kind of stuff, how much money they make. Um, so um, that is it for the monk. Now, I said earlier, well, what makes the monk so awesome? I kept telling people that, you know, they have this really awesome ability. Well, it's, it's the open hand stun. Let's, let's pull that up again. Let's see if we can find it for you. Here we go. Open hand damage. You've got to see this. This is incredible. This paragraph right here. Okay? So, open hand damage is shown on the table. We looked at it a little earlier. So, Elephant EC, her open hand damage is like 3 to 13. You can see it right here. 3 to 13 open hands. She can do, you know, left hand, right hand. Not that great. Okay damage. Nothing amazing. All right? In addition, the monk has a chance to stun or even kill an opponent. The opponent is stunned by a monk for 1 to 6 melee rounds. I remember in the original game, a melee round is uh, 60 seconds. But I'm using segments, which are six seconds. So I just use, when I, you see me roll a stun from Elephanisi, I roll a two, right? And then suddenly that's only that's a 12 second stun. There's no MMO that even has a stun that long. You'd be destroyed in that amount of time. So I have no limitations on her stunning something taller than her as well. Let me read you the rule the rest of the way, and then we can talk about that in, in more detail. So we have this Mr. Smurfette here, dude, coming after her. How would it work? <clears throat> If the monks to hit dice roll exceeds the minimum number by five, okay, the to hit score of the monks are never modified by strength. We already said that earlier. The chance to kill is percentage equal to the armor class of the opponent modified by the number of experience levels above seven, which the monk has attained. So in her case, she's level 10 monks. There's an additional 3% chance. So say, let's just do this frost giant attack right here. Say this frost giant was armor class four, okay? Say, so she, what does she need to hit armor class 4? Let's pull up her sheet again. To AC 0, she needs a 14. To hit armor class 4, she only needs a 10. So let's say she rolls a if she rolls a 15 or higher, she'll stun this guy. And she's going to have a main hand and an off hand. So she's going to have a you know, left hand and a right hand attack because you're punching. Right? It's not like you just swing with one hand and just drop it in your guard and let it go. So she has a chance to stun the guy. Now, it's not something he gets to save against. There's no saving throw against the monk stun. So that means you can hit this guy hard enough, choose the location because of her understanding of anatomy to flat out stun this guy. So in this case, you might want to punch him in the groin or if she's attacking him from behind while Mercedes up on the front line, she might want to bust this guy in the back of the leg. So this is her back here in the back, right? So she, if you're playing a monk, what you want to do, let's just focus on her in the back there, right? You're playing the monk. You say, "Well, I want to, you know, attack this guy from the flank, and I want to, I want to bust him in the kneecap and pop this nerve ending on the back of his leg and that, to get a stun off on him while Mercedes in front just wailing on him." So the stun is really, really, really powerful. It happens a lot. Um, it's something that uh, sometimes you may want to do an attack where your goal is just to run up and stun something that's running. So let's just give you an example of that. We had a situation in the steading in the Hill Giant Chief where we had a bunch of bugbears that were all getting their butts kicked. And there was three guys in the back of the room, and they're going to run, 
and run down the hallway, and everyone's engaged fighting, and everyone had killed a bunch of guys. So there's a bunch of dudes laying on the ground that were dead, like this. And I think it's an article called Kidney Shot from the Monk. And uh, these guys try to run. So they try to run away. And so as they're trying to flee, um, two things happen. So these guys are trying to run. So these guys have a 12-inch movement rate. Her movement rate is 24. Okay, so she can move two steps for every one of their steps. So this first guy took one step. She could take two. He takes another step. She takes two more. So she's able to catch up to them, hit this guy from behind. And, he, you know, dropping his dexterity bonus to his armor class, I just took away two from his armor class, land a stun and stun the guy in place. And then the rest of the group can come up behind and just chop this guy to pieces and kill him. So a, ch a monk chain stunning things running is fantastic uh, tactic to play when you're playing the monk. Also, another thing to think about is if you're playing the monk, you think about this. My job is to be crowd control. So if you're playing a rogue in the arena in World of Warcraft, you want to stun people at the right time. Stun the healer, whatever you're going to do. You're not going to be just standing there spamming DPS attacks all day long and hoping someone's healing you. So you have a fight like this where here's someone with a two-handed sword taking on these two guys. You're hidden in shadows. You can get a surprise attack and stun this guy and shut him down. Then run over to this guy and pop him and stun him and then stun him. Then all three will be stunned. Everyone just coup de gras the guy. Depend what your ruling is on the coup de gras attack. So this is probably the most powerful thing about the monk in the game. Um, I also allow characters to chain stun. So let's put it this way. Um, you say she comes up and rolls and stuns this guy. He's on the ground unconscious. And let's say we roll the d6 for how long he's stunned and just say six seconds. And then the next melee around she attacks and stuns this guy. He's down on the ground. Let's roll the stun number for him. Another six seconds. And then we do the last dude here. And let's use a different die. Maybe we give us a better number four. So that four is 24 seconds. So he's stunned for 24 seconds. So you'd be able to say as a DM, like, this guy, you crack him over the head. He kind of stumbles and falls. But he seems like he's trying to get back up. This guy here falls head down, first, first, uh, feet first, face first, but puts his hands on the ground, starts to get back up. And this guy just collapses and falls limp you know the fight's called off by the ufc ref when that happens so when that happens that kind of description can give the players an idea of which one to kill let's jump on this two guys and coup de gras them first this other guy's stunned let the cleric kill him so those are the important things to think about tactically when you're fighting so the chance to outright kill um you know, it'll happen. It'll happen. You never know. It's just low percentage chance. If we go back to our, our little example here that we had a few minutes ago where we were fighting a, a frost giant, right? Let's just use a token for this. Say we're fighting the frost giant, and, sh and sh the frost giant is fighting um, the warrior, the war this fighter here, right? Elephantisi's coming in from the flank, and she tries to land a stun on this guy. Um, she rolls to hit. She uh, hits five or higher. She rolls a stun. The guy's stunned for one melee round. So his armor class is four. Okay. Now read this carefully here, right? The chance to kill is a percentage which equals the armor class of the opponent modified by the number of experience levels above seven, which the monk is. It has attained. You don't need to say that part. So she's level 10. So you start off with the armor class as a percentage. To say his armor class is four, so there's a 4% chance. She's level 10, that's three levels above seven, so plus three gives you 7% chance to stun and to, to outright kill. I mean, the stun's going to happen automatically. She hits rolls five higher on any to hit roll. So, you know, you could roll the percent I'll die, and the odds of getting it, that's a 91. The odds of getting the 7% is low, but you never know. That could be, that could happen on Orcus, okay? So that's very powerful. Um, that's, things like that that happen in the game, you'll never forget as long as you live when you stunned Orcus and killed him in one hit. Uh, or Calabdra, the Vault of the Drow, was stunned and killed in one hit. I mean, the monk can pull out um, some heroic things. And if you play the monk properly and you chant your arm at the right time and you try to minimize the amount of armor class you're going up against to land those hits, um, you want to hit things that are low armor class first and get them stunned and taken out quick so the party can just mop everything up. All right, so we're going to wrap this up. So this is a long episode, but the monk is a complex character. I want to make sure I went through it pretty thoroughly and talk about some of the details. The one thing I will say in summary is that if you're going to ever consider playing a monk, your role is not to be a frontline fighter, okay? You and the thief should be working together. You and the you and the thief or the assassin should be hiding in shadows and staying together. You should be using your hair noise. Um, you have a, a warrior, your warrior up in the front. I so see you have a barbarian fighting this frost giant. There's another frost giant here attacking, and you got a cleric that's going to heal in the back. And... Uh, 
you and the rogue are hiding in shadows, well, let the assassin and you focus fire the same target. Try to get the stun off. He'll easily kill it, get the stun off, and kill it. There's no restriction on how often you can stun. So the, the stun is a long time in a game. Even if using the segment rule for time that I use, a six-second stun is someone gets another melee round of attack, they can just roll their damage. They don't even have to roll to hit anymore. All right, that's pretty much it for the monk. Um, if you're willing to take a gamble on something, play the lowest hit point, lowest armor class, class in a game with the most powerful, unstoppable CC possible, uh, the monk is for you. The other abilities that they have are interesting and cute, um, can add some interesting resource to you. Um, if you want to be a walking wave of destruction, play a thief. If you want to be unkillable and never hit and never miss and do consistent damage, play a fighter or a paladin or a ranger. Um, if you want to be an area effect death machine, play a druid. If you want to be an area effect nuker, play a, an illusionist or a magic user. But if you want to be a really interesting, creative melee class, don't let the monk fool you because uh, it's a very, very, very powerful class. And of course, when you slip and bust your channel on the end of a bed, you look like an idiot. All right, that's it for Classic DM. This has been our Player's Handbook uh, walk through all the different classes for Learn How to Play First Edition. If you have any questions or comments, be sure to uh, add them at the bottom of the video, and we'll talk to you again real soon. Take care. We'll probably go back in time and do a Magic Users our next episode. Talk to you soon later.